coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Cato Lake is a really special place to visit. It's a place unlike any other within the state. That's really one of the most impressive things about this ranch, the fact that you can literally see so far. One of the biggest hunting violations in Texas is no proof of hunter education. Yes, Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Cattle Lake State Park, it's the only area in Texas that you can find this environment, this habitat. There's not a lot of people out here to where it's going to be crazy. Uh, you can really get out here and just recharge your soul. Caddo Lake State Park is the gateway to Caddo Lake. We are located four miles upriver on Big Cypress Bayou. And Caddo Lake is special because it is the largest naturally formed lake here in Texas. And it was formed around the year 1800 when water from Big Cypress Bayou tried to merge with the Red River, but met a giant log jam called the Great Raft. We are a Civilian Conservation Corps park. July 4th, 1934 is when the park officially opened for public use. The first thing you see as you drive into the park are iconic pillars that were built back in the 1930s and are still standing today. And as you drive through the park, you'll see the cabin area. Those were the cabins that the CCC lived in when they were building this park, as well as the rec hall, which is where they would have had their meals. So there's a little bit of magic from the CCC left all over the park. <laughs> There's nothing that's going to be too hardcore as far as the trails go. They're, they're pretty standard, a couple uphill here and there. Here we go. So you can come out here with your family and just be out here for a couple hours on the trails and enjoy yourselves. Park programs are a really great way to get your kids involved in nature. And you just want to tap it on the bottom. Oh, nice. Good one. Whoa. That's cool. The kids are getting to really experience it for themselves, really get to explore at their own pace, and just see what's out there. It's called a cricket frog. Oh, and they'll get bigger than this. These are just real little ones. Oh, can, can I hold one of them? Yes, critters and mud and all that stuff, that is their favorite thing probably ever. <laughs> I want my kids to actually come and physically put their hands into the water to see the creatures up close. It's not just something they, they know about in their head, but something they feel in their heart. What you think, is it fun? Yeah. I love it here. Ooh. This is my home. Mm -hmm. I hope I catch them because they're pretty good size. <laughs> oh, honey, I, I just enjoy being here. Yeah, have some me time. Sure. Ooh, I got some. <laughs> oh, I can fish a little bit. <laughs> mm hmm. When I'm, I'm sitting here fishing like oh, this. Oh, come here, baby. I don't have a care in this world. Oh, I got a goggle eye. Hey, baby daddy. <laughs> oh, baby. I love it. Paddling, it's nice because you don't have the buzz of the motor from a boat. So you get to hear the movement of the water and you get to kind of feel like you're supposed to be there instead of in a big clunky boat where you're just kind of rocking. <laughs> and you get to get really close to the trees and see the detail of the wood and the hanging of the moss. And it's just nice to see the little intricate details of nature. is a really special place to visit. It's a place unlike any other within the state. This is pretty cool. 
you really have the opportunity to come out here and, and really recharge and be a part of nature. Here is a mysterious, quiet, wild getaway that you just don't find anywhere else. This land was bare dirt when I came here. You were hard pressed to find a blade of grass on it. My name is David Kittner, and I'm the manager for Killam Ranch Properties. My name is David Killam, and my family is the owner of the Duval County Ranch Company. And last bunch. That's really one of the most impressive things about this ranch, the fact that you can literally see so far. While you look off into the distance and see these great vistas, you can look at the ground and you see all the diversity of the different plants and uh, forbs that are right here. I think that's a beautiful thing too. told David early on, I said, I'm a fix-it kind of guy. I like a challenge, and I'd be happy to, to work on this place if you want to fix it. And so he said, do whatever you need to do. And it's covered in grass now, in Forbes. You know, where you have a plant cover, the soil temperature is 40 to 50 degrees less than it is on bare dirt. When you look at the diversity of brush and, and just this ground cover that we have right here and the forb production that's generated in this area, it gives us the kind of nutrition that uh, produces these kinds of antlers right there. There's markers all over this ranch that show anybody how productive and what a, a wonderful piece of property this is for wildlife. You know, just here talking, we're listening to quail call. The brush diversity, the herbaceous plant diversity that we have around us is just amazing. In South Texas, in our semi-arid environment, it's hard to have too much water. We are a for-profit ranching enterprise. And fortunately, the Killams don't need to take out of whatever we make. And so I plow that money back into infrastructure on the ranch. That's where the 350 miles of water lines have gotten paid for. I tell everybody that wants to be a biologist, you better learn how to manage the land first because you can't manage anything else if you can't manage the land. We use chemical applications by an airplane, we use prescribed burning, we use roller chopping, and we always have wildlife on the forefront of our thinking when we do these practices. We look at livestock as not only being a profit center for the ranch, but also being an important tool to manage our, our habitat. We use rotational grazing exclusively here. We like to see about a year's rest on these pastures. We call those cattle every morning and use that siren to train them. All we have to do is get on a hill and blow the siren and sit there and just be a little patient. And those cattle come to us and then they'll follow me wherever I need them to go. The slower you go, the quicker you get done. The hunting enterprise is, is a very good business for us. Our leases are geared towards families. We want them to bring their kids and their grandkids out here and enjoy the property. It's something that should be shared. We do see a lot of value in outreach and education and we have wounded veterans 
We've done that for over 10 years and we have the opportunity to share this with others and have them participate and, and enjoy the beauty of the outdoors. And that's been personally satisfying to be able to give back a, just a, a little bit. They take extensive records, which makes my job a lot easier. And I can do a lot with the extensive data they collect. They run their game animal, their, their white-tailed deer and turkey and quail, just like a business. They take real data and records. We don't guess. We make real decisions based on that data. This land is going to be here long after we're gone. To me, to have a positive impact and carry it forward to future generations in better shape than it was when I got here is extremely important to me. And, uh, you know, I love it. That's part of my passion of the, of the land. That's what we try to do in all our management is try to keep uh, wild places wild. So I think, you know, we want this to always remain a, a part of South Texas and represent what South Texas really is. Oh, wow. One of the biggest hunting violations in Texas is no proof of hunter education. The hunter is required to carry proof of hunter education or deferral on their person while engaged in hunting. Every hunter born after September 1st, 1971 must successfully complete a hunter education training course. Whenever you have a good shot, go ahead and take it. Good shot, man. Great shot. Minimum age of certification is nine years. Hunters under nine years of age must be accompanied by a person who is at least 17, is a licensed hunter in Texas, has passed hunter education or is exempt, sure. and they must be within normal voice control. Hunters age nine through 16, you must successfully complete a hunter education course or be accompanied. Good shot, good shot, son. Look at that. Awesome, awesome. And hunter 17 and over must successfully complete a hunter Woo! education course or purchase a hunter education deferral and be accompanied. The hunter education deferral allows a person to defer certification for up to one year. The following persons are exempt from requirements to complete a hunter education course, active duty members and honorably discharged veterans of the United States Armed Forces, the Texas Army National Guard, Texas Air National Guard, or Texas State Guard, or persons who are serving or have previously served as a peace officer. For more information, go to our website at TPWD and visit our Hunter Education tab, or call 1-800-792-1112. Right. Anthony Stringo. I'm gonna go try the ship channel. This base river calls Port O'Connor home. I was born here, that's all I've ever done. You know, Matagorda Bay mainly. While Gulf shrimpers may stay at sea for weeks, bay shrimpers take things one day at a time. This right here is a new concept for me for the last 10 years. This is called a lazy line. So you don't have to pull the whole net in and get to the back of it. 
A lot has changed over the decades, and Anthony has had to adapt. His catch now includes Atlantic croaker, a fish recreational anglers like to use for bait. You know, the people, the weekenders got to be here. The people that buy them has got to be here. You catch all you want, but if there's nobody to buy them, you're not going to make nothing. You want one about that size for fishing. That right there, put it back. Uh. While Anthony's been shrimping for most of his life, he's still decades behind his dad. 50 years, I'd say, yeah. You know, probably one of the oldest left out here. Might be one or two more his age left. So one, two, one. And I thought I'm gonna do is reinforce the edges here. Add another string here to stay together. Jesse's string goes 75. And when he's not shrimping, He's mending his nets. Pilings, tires, There's just so many different things. The Stringos have been shrimping for generations. Here's Jesse's dad, Junior, in a Houston Chronicle from 1930. Oh yeah, he's the one that taught me. He has done in the 50s. Oh, that was so damn much shrimp, we didn't know what to do in them days. Those days were indeed prosperous, says Mark Fisher, who studied the shrimping industry for 25 years. Uh, shrimping in the 1950s it was a very good decade. Uh, price of shrimp was, was very high. Fuel, fuel was cheap, labor was abundant. There was almost no government regulation back then. If you could work hard and, and uh, handle it, it was all for the taking. I mean, there were lots of shrimp. They kept doing them down after about 50 years, working them. Yet Jesse is still out working them. Oh, uh, what happened? His old boat, the High Roller, rolls along. You know how it gets old and everything coming apart? Oh, I don't want to stick my hands in there. I have to guide the cables back and forth like you do a rod and reel. Jesse has a new partner. His brother James, who just sold his shrimping license oh, and his boat. Yeah, I was getting too old to work by myself now, and I just had to give it up. Whew. I'm all right with it. I know I knew I couldn't do it no more, so I just went ahead and sold everything, boat, license, and everything. While there are 300 or so licensed bay shrimpers now. Back in the late 80s, Gulf and Bay shrimpers were out in force, with more than 5,000 licensed shrimpers on the water. With that much pressure, the state of Texas started to buy back shrimping licenses. The reason? Shrimp nets bring in much more than just shrimp. For every pound of shrimp that is caught, they also catch four pounds of other species. These species have no commercial value, and they're just pitched over the side. It doesn't really sound that so bad, but when you're talking about 60, 80 million pounds of shrimp being caught every year, that's a lot of bycatch. We would buy back a commercial shrimp license and then retire it, which in turn would reduce the amount of bycatch that is being caught. Hang on. Now James has a little extra money in his pocket, and he and his brother Jesse can work together. You ready? Yeah. I'd go crazy if I had to sit home and do nothing. I had one brother retired at 62 and he didn't make it to 64. That's sorry. There weren't too many shrimp, a few croakers and a, and a few ribbon fish. There weren't too much of nothing. Nah, it wasn't too much. It's the unknown that's the constant concern in this business. You never know there. You know? Sometimes you have a good year and next year you might not get you know, hardly nothing. Always different. It's not always the same. Or you can depend on it all the time. Yeah, we picked the wrong place to go to. Get the hell out of here. This is it. We're going home. And I had a bad luck in one day. They can only bet on a better day tomorrow, as shrimping still pulls them back to the bay. Well, as long as I'm able to work, I'm going to work. There's just no hurry no more. Tell you, just let it go one step at a time. <laughs> oh yeah, he, he still gets around good for his age and what he does. He, he's one of the last ones left. 
Yeah. He's going to do it till he can't do it no more. Yeah. Anthony is out this morning, too. Sunshine with a northeast wind. They're starting out by checking what's called a trinet. Oh, we have the little net down, looking around just to find the best spot where we won't be dragging for nothing. You're trying to see what you can find. And you get an idea. We're at 15, Anthony. Best try so far. You dropping it in? Yeah. We'll get the jump chain on the side. Anthony grew up out here and has literally shrimped Matagorda Bay since he was a baby. They put me in a baby crib going out there like we went today. Never done nothing else. <laughs> Back then and even now, every day is a gamble. It's just a challenge because you don't know what you're going to catch. You love to get out there and make good money today, $1,000 a day, and the next two weeks catch nothing. Like I said, it's just a challenge. I love it. Looks like okay. shrimp in there. Yeah, it looks like shrimp in there. Yeah! Since these guys are catching shrimp for use as live bait, it's a race to get them back to the bait shop. More money this way. About 10 times as much money. It takes more effort to keep them alive. You got to have pumps running. You got to drag shorter drags. That was pretty good for, for live bait. That was, that was a pretty good drag. Hi! <laughs> Anthony's made it back to Port O'Connor, and it's time to unload today's catch. We're picking the croakers out, the golden ones. Get shrimp out now? Yeah, here, give me a scoop here where I can get rid of this one. A little bit more. We got live shrimp caught, we caught some bait, and we got, what, almost 40 quarts of shrimp? Mm-hmm. A little bit, pay for the field. The fresh from the sea table shrimp is where the money used to be made. These are the big shrimp. We ought to be getting four dollars a pound for them shrimp right there. But the market's not there because the market they, they get so much from overseas and the farm raised shrimp. Foreign farm raised shrimp operations have taken over. Aquacultured shrimp they can be raised at a much lower price than you can catch them in the wild. 90% of the shrimp consumed in the U.S. are farm-raised. It's cheaper to grow them than it is to catch them. So the price of shrimp has actually dropped. Uh, the dockside value of shrimp today is lower than it was in the 1980s. Kind of throws the wind out of your sails. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the price of shrimp fell. People went to go find something else to do, you know. The changes leave Anthony as the last in his family's business. You can't make no more with it. I mean, it's just, uh, unless she has kids and they want to do it, but other than that, yeah. And yet, after a hard day of work in these difficult times, there is still reason for a smile. <laughs> Nothing broke, so we don't have to fix nothing to go back out tomorrow. So that's a plus. That's a real big plus. Despite the low prices, the pounding on the body, the last of the string goes carries on. It just it's habit. I mean, I just something I've done all my life. Somebody ever said you you went to college? Yeah, I went to college at Matagorda Bay. <laughs>